just briefly one second who I am, who we are. NRC, for those who don't know it, is the Norwegian Refugee Council. We are a non-governmental organization with head office just down the road. We have about 3,000 staff in 20 countries and we work and protect rights of displaced people in an armed conflict. We're not working with natural disasters like Red Cross Movement is doing, we're working only with armed conflict. And of course we are politically and religiously independent. The countries around the world, most of the countries we work in, you know from the, from the daily media, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Iran, and, and so on. But before telling and discussing with you what can we do when rebuilding, I would like to briefly explain the context and what type of factors we experience in the context. In an ideal world, we have a happy family living somewhere in their home and then suddenly their life is hit by, a natural, by, a, by an armed conflict. Their house is destroyed and they have to run away. They have to seek cover somewhere. They become either internally displaced persons or refugees. And now a lot of actors are coming in. The actors that are also playing their game, their tune in, in this conflict. The NGOs are coming in, but not only one, many of them, among them also NRC. And all have their different ways of thinking and helping these people and, and trying to understand their problem. Then the entire United Nations are coming in, not one UN, even though it's supposed to. There are a lot of different organizations, but when, all are different. Then, in addition, all the donors, the governments that give the money, they also have a view, a focus on these kind of problems. And then their own government, the national government, but also maybe local governments where people's houses were destroyed, plus a local government where they actually are currently now. They also try to support. And all these actors interact with the people and all would like to do something good for them. And if there is not clear coordination and extreme clear rules of the operation, it will be chaos. You, you can just imagine. Because what the people actually want, they don't want the chaos, they just want to go back and build up their house and restart their lives. But even this, just the pure building of the house, <coughs> just forget about all the actors, even this is not so easy. Because it is not just the physical rebuilding of the house, it's also about many factors that need to take into consideration. It's the climate, it's their own skills, their resources, their culture, their family size, housing, land and property, legal issues around it, available infrastructure, destroyed infrastructure, and all these kind of things. So all these things we need to take into consideration <coughs> before it's actually happened that these people are come back. So I hope you understand that this is quite a challenging task. And there I would like to explain a bit how are we doing it. Up front, urban cities are dynamic. There are a lot of coping mechanisms. So if we are not coming as the international community to help, we see that some of the people actually manage to rebuild. So something is happening with, even without us being present. Here an example from Nar al Barret camp in Tripoli, northern Lebanon, 2007, destruction after Fatal al-Islam was hiding in this area with only 120 fighters. And it took months of shelling to get, not they didn't manage to get them all out. But once this is destroyed, immediately people are starting to rebuild. They find some means to do it. Here an example from Baghdad where we are working. You still see the remaining concrete structures and then some straw houses suddenly are popping up. What is difficult to see there, it, it disappeared. It's like when people are, uh, these houses upgraded over time. So you basically see that one straw house, a month later, they add a sink sheet roof and then it goes on. Those who have a bit more money, they actually find some salvaged material and just rebuild. But you see that this is the breeding ground for new conflict because this land owned, was owned by someone else before. There were other houses standing there. So the more permanent this gets, the lesser chances for actually a solution you have in the long run. And those who have not the means to build something like this, they are just put, uh, pushed into the outskirts and these kind of informal settlements or shanty towns are just popping up. So when we are coming in now, we feel that we need to do something because either we create new problems if we don't do something or 
those vulnerable people are just falling off because they can't manage for themselves. So when we come in, remember the chaotic pictures, we need to have clear rules and understanding of the game. And we call the solutions we provide in these phases some settlement options. There are a number of them, different options where people can settle. Host families, collective center, self-settled camps and so on. I will go with you now through some of them. But before doing this, it needs to be taken into consideration when we assist that people are not stable. Urban areas are dynamic. People, after a crisis, maybe move in to a collective center, a school, an empty governmental building, and are there for a number of days. Then they make contacts with their family, their friends. Then they move there. After a couple of weeks, the tension within the family is rising because they live tight together. Then they look for another option, settle somewhere illegally maybe, maybe close where there's a livelihood, and think people are changing. So for us, trying to assist them is very difficult because wh where are they now? Who is actually needing something? So people move between, between the options. But once they're in these options, we try to, to assist them around. Right? And then just to explain now some of them closer. Host family support. Here, just a picture from the Baker Valley in Lebanon I took earlier this year from the Syrian influx. A typical example, in the backyard of a house, an old uh, building was just rebuilt. You see the, the window is just taped with plastic. And we actually think this is a very good option because basically it keeps people together in a stable environment. Another option that we often support are urban self-settlements. People are just settling somewhere. This is a picture from downtown Mogadishu in 2007 already taken during the full, full crisis there, where people are just just settling down. And here it's clear, whenever we do something here, we need to do it temporary. We cannot start building a latrine and, and, and a well there and a, a school building because this plot b belongs to someone. But we still think it's a good option for people because it, they chose to be there because there they have options for livelihood. So as long as they can be there and we help them temporarily to be there up to a certain degree, we think this is a very good option. Very often used are collective centers. That is uh, Mahmoud Ab uh, this is the Gaza hospital in, in, uh, in downtown Beirut. Uh, and um, these collective centers are for us very easy to assist people there. And we like it, it was an easy, straightforward logistics operation. Because you know where the place is, you know who is there, and you can just drop off your food or non-food items. But also for urban uh, dwellers, camps are an option. This is a satellite image from the world's biggest refugee camp, Dadaab, in, in Kenya. Currently, 480, 540,000 people living, living in, this, uh, in this camp. So this is a giant. Camps, even though we try to avoid them because they have a tendency to, to stay on, the DARP was opened in 1991 and still in an emergency stage 22 years later. These camps are actually planned and uh, fulfill certain minimum standards. So, these are four of the options. There are many others, but I thought the most relevant for urban settings I try to explain. There are four options where people can settle. But then we still need to find out what to do, how to help these people. And a big problem in, in the urban discussion that is happening in, in the global shelter sector is like trying to identify those people who are in need. And traditionally, humanitarian actors following the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, had this <coughs> idea of displacement. So when a person was displaced by an armed conflict, they have certain displacement needs because they lost everything, they're on the run, they need to be supported. But in an urban area, people do not tend in the same way to, to go, that, go very far. Maybe they only move to the neighbor's house or the displacement is not so clear. So there's current a very big change in the perception and basically looking at displacement affected. Not the displaced, but displacement affected population. And you see, the displaced, they need different support. It's either for them a local integration, where they are currently, to be there, settle somewhere else, and asylum is one option sometimes for some of them, 
return where they come from. For the non-displaced, it's basically repairing their houses. And for the indirect affected, it's their livelihood recovery because it puts a stress on their income. But the biggest problem is in urban areas to say, what is actually development work? What is, well, there's urban poverty. It has been before the crisis, and even when the human giants will leave, there is that structural problems. There are shanty towns, there's a lack of infrastructure, and all these things as you know about. But who is then eligible to, to get this short-term humanitarian response or this support? And I think this graph helps us very much. On the left side, you see this curve. It's a natural distribution. You have a middle class, and you have poor, and you have a few rich. And the blue one there, this is the traditional, the poor ones that are supported by, by, by development actors. But then suddenly something is happening, a crisis, and people are pushed and falling off this normal curve and are suddenly out here. And you can tell actually what we try to do is to help them to basically go back, to push them back into their, their life where they have been. And this, this can be people from all type of parts of the society that are suddenly falling off there. And in order to find out what these people need, some good old document from 1999, the DFID, the Department for International <coughs> Development from, from the UK, the DFID Livelihood Framework, comes, comes up, where basically this is used as an assessment tool and saying, everybody makes a living out of his assets. I make my living out of my bit of knowledge, a bit of cash I have, part of the social networks, knowing people like you that invite me or having my bike to bring me here so I can make, I'm using them. And people are doing this the same. And we try to find out what our people, what they need. And where have the crisis, where did the crisis hit them hardest? And where can then we provide assistance? Categorizing, we have actually 19, I listed 12 here, different assistance methods. So if, for example, if we find out in our assessment that certain people lost their identity papers. They cannot prove that this plot of land belonged to them. So they cannot rebuild anything. Well, then easily we can come in and help them for the documentation process, the building permits. If material is the only thing that people need because they have the money and they have the skills but they don't, can't access the building material in a, in a crisis situation because of logistical shortcuts, well, then we decide to support people in this. So this is quite a bit a different approach that is happening in urban areas to tailor it much more to the, to the problem because there are existing coping me mechanisms in place. Just one picture, like this clearly shows that there can't be one solution and there can't be one type of shelter design that, that helps. Every week we get a call from someone that actually developed a new shelter prototype, flat pack, that can be sent out and it will, it will not help. Because you forget that what the urban dynamics are and what type of coping mechanisms and strategies people have. This is an example where, and they actually have been built. But by even knowing now different settlement options, knowing the needs of the people, knowing how to address them to particular livelihood assets, we still haven't solved the problem of what type of standard, what type of house, what type of support shall they get? And this is a very critical, uh, critical uh, question because it's, it's touching so many issues. It touches about culture, identity, values, social status, and all these, these issues. So what, what is adequate? Is a tent, an emergency tent after a destruction, actually ever an adequate solution for someone that lived downtown in a house? Well, it depends on the expectations, habits, and context. On the left side, you, you see, for example, um, a typical UNHCR tunnel tent erected in, in Georgia. Nice graveled road, elevated floor, street light, drainage, and all this. On. And it, people really didn't, didn't see this as, as a solution for them. 
just for a couple of days. On the right side, the same year, 2008, Eastern uh, Congo, Goma, people from urban areas came into these camps. This is rocky lava ground, but people there accepted it uh, in a way because it's about their expectations and they see this as something that, that supports them. Also here, a picture from uh, Georgia proper. What conditions actually constitute an emergency and what standard is adequate as an emergency response? Basically, it's not a given standard and it's about negotiation and finding, finding this out what, what people are eligible to. The question is, is this a good adequate bathroom? It's in a collective center. This bathroom is shared by 12 families. There's only one cold water tap and one sink. Is this adequate? <coughs> Maybe yes, because before we came, it, it, it looked like this on, on the left side. When you look at this house, nice with the flowers there and the curtains and so on, is this actually the minimum standard? Is this, is this what the Norwegian taxpayers and MFA and, and other donors are also supporting? Is this the minimum? Or is this actually far beyond what, what we as an emergency operator can actually do? When you ask these, these young men there, they actually consider this house by far only as a very emergency situation because they had a three-story house before, they had running warm water, and now they're just living somewhere on the outside, have a, have a hand duck, duck well, just a sink sheet roof, no real insulation and so on. For them, this $12,000 house, where they also contributed very much to it, it's just a temporary thing. They would, as soon as they can, move back to their, to their house, to the place where they, where they lived before. Even though many shelter actors are working in, in urban areas, the work is still ongoing. I just would like to highlight that a couple, two years, three years ago, uh, together with another NGOs, uh, we, I and another person, we wrote this uh, urban shelter guidelines available for you if you want, because there we exactly work on this kind of uh, discussion, who is eligible and what type of assistance methods can be given. Because we basically feel that even the humanitarian community works in urban areas, many people are still insecure. The technical skills in most NGOs is around rural, not so much around plot ratio, site coverage, zoning, building codes, and, and all these things. So there is an ongoing learning process. Briefly before I stop, a project example from Lebanon, the Beka Valley, the Syrian influx where I have been earlier this year. In this project example, I try to summarize now what I was, have been talking about. The settlement options and how to assist people. Here as a background, the Syrians came into the Beka to have very selected villages that actually that took them in because of religious divides between Sunni and Shia. Not all villages are willing to take these refugees. Most emigrant combinations were, of course, overcrowded with an average of 12, 13 people per host. Often they lived in one room with a shared toilet and so on. This is just an example. They're just in the backyard of the house of the family or the, the friends, the relatives. They dug a hole and made a temporary toilet structure in the basement somewhere in a room without windows, 13 people, they just have a remaining of a, of a sink. But you also see the so cell phone. This is urban people coming, the people that are used to have a good life in Syria. And suddenly they come and live under terrible circumstances. <coughs> what, what we said that we had our assessment, and basically said that an average it costs about $1,900 per host family to upgrade to a minimum standard. And we clearly saw that this host family thing was a good solution for the beginning, but even a couple of days and weeks into the displacement, tension arose. People have been moving across from one family to another, to friends here and there, because it was tight, it was no cultural appropriate, no privacy, bad, bad sanitation standards and so on. So when we came in, we looked at all these houses and made a quick assessment saying high urgent shelter needs or just urgent shelter needs. And if one criteria applied, no toilet, no <coughs> connection to sewage system, no kitchen and so on, then they were eligible for the high urgent shelter needs. Once they were eligible, then um, 
we basically rebuilt the whole thing. They got the cash they could use to find a private contractor. They got it in stages, paid, or redid it, and they rebuilt it. If it was just urgent shelter needs, then they got vouchers where they could go to local suppliers and, and fix, fix the building material. So, this is all from the presentation. Just to summarize, urban assistance is new to the humanitarian actors. Just two, three years ago, it came on the global level into the coordination mechanisms. The Interagency Standing Committee has that had a working group around this. And there's a current trend to say, not only displacement, but displacement affected population, recognizing that urban areas are not traditionally the places where people come and go, but maybe also internally move. And looking at the own coping mechanisms, what people have and the dynamics a city can, can provide by and taking this as a part of our response into consideration. Thank you very much.